Friends, what's good? Kyle Henderson along with Clint Lamb of Bama Insider. Thank you very much for joining us. Definitely uh, check out our coverage on um, our website, Bama Insider. Clint, it was the first practice today. We got to hear from Nick Saban. We got the sights and sounds. Um, you, your uh, your takeaways, and we'll kind of pipe in some Saban, but um, your biggest takeaways, I guess, today from, uh, from, you know, just finally these guys back in action. First of all, I was pumped to be you know, back covering something that was actually happening live. We were getting to react to stuff rather than trying to predict what we think is going to happen. And there will continue to be a lot of that as the season progresses. But uh, first of all, Nick Saban talking about investing in yourself, which is one of the first things he brought up in his uh, opening statement. He talked about, you know, eating right. He was talking about sleeping right, you know, making sure you're hydrated, just doing all the little things that you need in order to make sure that you're in, in the position to be able to get better every time you step on the practice field. I don't think that was a coincidence. I don't know who is not following along, but I mean, I don't know about you and, and I kind of want to get your take on this real quick, but did he seem a little bit more ill than he did yesterday? Do you? Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I mean, the, the thing with Saban is uh, I'm trying to, I'm adding like the actual practice footage while we talk. Um, look, I, I mean, Saban seemed like almost like in mid-season form and in terms of like he just he doesn't have time to just BS. I mean, I, this is the first time, honestly, Clint, that I saw him with sunglasses. I mean, we, yeah. how, how long have we been covering the team? I've never seen him with shades. Have you? No. And I, I, that was the first thing I noticed in the uh, uh, yeah. in the video that we yeah, watched. I've never seen him with sunglasses before. I mean, I thought that was like it was really something that jumped out to me. I've never seen him with shades um, in terms of like where he's at. I mean, you know. These practices, I think, I think Saban, like during this time, he's so dialed in to get this team to where it could be. Um, so, I mean, in terms of like where he's at, you know, the like mentality wise, I think, man, he's just so dialed in. I mean, I think people are so eager for him to like take a step back to stop being um, kind of that dog that he is. But he's not. I mean, the guy is 70 years old and he's still uh, is just rolling. I love, you know, the way he addressed injuries today. He's like, we're not going to have an injury report after every single practice. I mean, it was, um, you know, it was almost like midseason form. Saban's ready to go. I know it's like, you know, cliche to say that, but I mean, Saban was, uh, he was, he was on today. Yeah. It, sometimes, you know, us as media, um, we, we end up asking too broad a questions, right? And I think that's exactly what happened with the injuries today. Uh, there, there, at least the injury question, I guess, is the way to put it. Um, everybody knew who was going to be one of the first people that was asked about as far as the injuries are concerned. Obviously, you know, Ja'Cory Brooks was working his way back from injury back during the spring. Uh, you know, you had Darian Dalcourt, Emil Ikior Jr., both of those two guys doing the same. So there was updates that we needed as far as guys who maybe were able to work their way back onto the field. But, you know, there had been some rumors going around with Cameron Latou that maybe he was going to miss some time. I just think that the initial question was a little bit too broad and he wasn't about it. You know, he, he's like, if you got something to ask me, ask it and I'll be happy to provide specific answers. But then once, you know, he revealed that about Cameron Latou, someone he, he did, if you noticed, he didn't actually say what was wrong with Latou. So we still don't officially know. We know he's going to be out for a little bit. We don't know how long he said he's going to miss some time in fall camp. He didn't say, you know, uh, anything about the season, not saying that that necessarily can't, doesn't mean that he won't miss time during the season. Just as of right now, it seems like it's a fall camp related issue. We'll have to wait and see on that. But then when he was asked uh, for, you know, if he knew what was wrong with Cameron Latou, all he said was, yeah, I do. I mean, that was his response. He was really not about, you know, getting into specific uh, specifics on that. To me, it was a very, uh, it was kind of like that. I don't know if you saw it, but that Nick Castellanos, uh, the baseball player, a couple of weeks ago, he was asked if he heard the crowd booing him, and he got really upset and said that was a stupid question. It kind of felt like that was Nick Saban's way of saying that was a stupid question by just saying, yeah, I do. Um, he just, a, we, we have that clip, Clint. Let's play it. Here, here absolutely. we go. Here's, uh, here's Saban today. Yeah, I do. Look, we're going to have guys that are able to practice and not able to practice on a daily basis. And I'm not giving it, I'm, we're not going to have an injury report every day about who practiced and who didn't practice. So there's, there's Saban and, and uh, Clint, you, you kind of, you, you touched on that. I mean, it was like, he's <clears throat> the, the way he's handling um, this opening press conference, I think is honestly like setting the tone for fall camp. 
to be honest. I mean, I was like, uh, I was, uh, I was pretty fired up about it. And then it, he, he touched on something that we talked about yesterday um, during our, our show when we got together after Nick's kids, when he was talking about kind of the rebuilding and, and here's that clip of Nick Saban talking about what he meant and just a, kind of a lot of fire from Saban today early on. Yeah, a lot was made about your comments yesterday about the two the twenty one team being uh, a rebuilding year. What is your response to that, and how do you? Well, I, I don't understand what's so hard to understand when the point being, we were young, and we should have nine starters back on offense and nine starters back on defense. That's the point I was trying to make. Six guys went out for the draft, so as we usually have to do. We have lots of rebuilding to do again this season. So that's the point that I was trying to make. So when you have a lot of young players playing, I don't think our standard is like everybody else's standard, but when you have a lot of young players playing, you're actually trying to rebuild so those guys get the kind of experience you need so they can play at the level you need them to play at so you can play to the standard you want to play to. Clint, your, t your take on that. 100% correct, first of all. Um, <laughs> I think he's pretty sick and tired of making comments and, and just blowing up in the media. You know, it, it's, you know, Paul Feinbaum had a take on it today as far as, and I thought it was a little bit, you know, a little bit, it was a little bit of a stretch in my opinion. Um, I, we talked about it yesterday. I knew what he was talking about and he hinted at it a little bit as far as, you know, Alabama's standard compared to other people's standard. It was definitely a rebuilding year, not just because of, you know, taking a step back a little bit as far as the success on the field, but it was the guys that you were having to replace. There's no way that you can look at what Alabama lost from that offensive group back in 2020, following the 2020 season, and think that, you know, there wouldn't be some type of rebuild. The fact that they were able to get the amount of, you know, production and success from that group, I think is pretty remarkable. But yeah, it, to me, it was definitely, uh, it was a typical saving response. I kind of knew it was coming. I knew the question was coming first of all, but I also knew, you know, kind of what his response was going to be. And I think it was a little bit more fiery than maybe I anticipated, but overall, you know, I think that, you know, he's, it was one very quick, small comment. It wasn't him trying to make that be the point. Um, and then, you know, people, people will grab a, a very small sound bite and they'll run with it. So here with Clint Lamb of Bama Insider. My name is Kyle Henderson. If you guys could hit the thumbs up, like, subscribe. We appreciate you guys more than you know. We got 129 inside the um, the YouTube channel right now. If you can get 129 thumbs up, we'd appreciate it. Clint, your take on uh, Jameer Gibbs. I mean, the, I, we, we saw a little bit of him during the springtime, but I mean, the guy comes out. I mean, the footwork is electric. I mean, I, I watch it several times. I mean, uh, your take uh, on, on a couple quick uh, clips that we were able to see. First of all, physically, he looks good, man. There were, there were a lot of players, man. You brought it up in your video uh, that you did earlier, kind of looking over the the uh, the B-roll they provided us. Malachi Moore looks good. Yeah. Uh, Brian Brandt certainly looks good. But Jameer Gibbs, man, just you know how explosive he is. He doesn't look like he lost any explosiveness, but it does look like he's a little bit, you know, more filled out. He's not, you know, he's not a really thick, um, you know, heavy built back, but I think he's got a great build for a guy his size. And I think that will be really important. And something else that I think Nick Saban touched on today that applies to Jim, not only Jameer Gibbs, but the running backs in general, is he, he talked about, you know, wanting to be a little bit more physical up front, you know, changing the identity of the offensive line. He does not feel like Alabama got enough movement in the run game last year. And he did also mention there was a couple of comments that kind of stood out in my mind. Number one, the way that he said, I like the coach that we have now coaching the offensive line. He loves the, the, the energy and enthusiasm that he brings to coaching the, the offensive line. I think that maybe that's something that maybe they were missing a little bit last year, maybe lacking in. But then also, um, you know, the, 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 the offseason additions, right? Because when he made that comment, you, your mind immediately goes to Tyler Steen because that's who you think is going to immediately contribute. And he's certainly going to be able to help in the run game. But I think equally, I wouldn't say equally as important, but some, you know, at least a couple of guys to bring up. Tyler Booker, the five-star true freshman offensive lineman, Elijah Pritchett's another one who just got on campus. Those are two guys that can help Alabama's offensive line as far as its run game is concerned and provide more depth if they get some opportunities. And I think that that's something that Alabama wants to be able to do is establish the run game a little bit more consistently because when you can do that, you can do so much off of it as far as play action, and it just takes a, a lot or puts a lot of pressure on opposing defenses. 
So I thought that was pretty key and something that he brought up. Hey, Chris, if we could uh, put some of the photos on uh, screen and kind of just go some of the photos and kind of go one by one. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, they had a lot of photos today. Let's kind of zoom in there on, on DJ Dell. If we could bring him up, kind of want to get um, some feedback on some of these defensive linemen that we saw today because there was a lot of guys that we're able to see today uh, from the defensive line perspective. I don't know if you noticed that, Clint, as well, but like, or, of course you did. You put together the photo gallery. Um, mm -hmm. but DJ Dell, um, <clears throat> look, there, a lot of people have mixed opinions about DJ Dell. My point is there's a lot of names to rotate within that defensive line. Do you feel that same way? Oh, 100%. Yeah, it's really the, the defensive line and what it's asked to do. You know, people don't understand right now, it, Alabama's defense is built around its edge rushers. You know, you, when you got a Will Anderson and a Dallas Turner, and then you got a Chris Braswell all in that rotation, that's kind of you're, you're going to try to pre present those guys with as many opportunities as possible because that is how, your most consistent and effective way to put pressure on opposing quarterbacks. And I think that, you know, with the defensive line, if they had a Jonathan Allen or a Quentin Williams type of player, they would be more than willing uh, to kind of put that player in a position to, to be a disruptor, which is exactly what those guys were. They don't really have a true disruptor on this defensive line, but that's not necessarily a problem because you've got disruptors out there on the edge. So what you do have is you have a very deep, stable group of interior defensive linemen who can, you know, take up space. They can eat up blocks. They can control the line of scrimmage. And when you have, you know, a, a large rotation of defensive linemen like that, I think it can be fairly effective. And, you know, if you're looking for that interior disruptor, you might get that from Jamil Burroughs. But even the, the standard guys, Justin Aboigby, like you mentioned, DJ Dell, Byron Young, all three of those guys are, are underrated defensive linemen. And I think for what Alabama asked them to do, they do it very effectively. And it helps the rest of the defense. It presents opportunities for other guys, you know, whether it be an off-ball linebacker or outside linebacker to make plays. And from a recruiting standpoint, and that's something, you know, that I've talked to a lot of people about, you know, they get upset because Alabama's not recruiting those interior defensive linemen with as much success as maybe they have in the past. You know, that can the, the, the current defense isn't really, you know, the system in place. Maybe it might not be as appealing to some of those recruits, but, it, you know, who it is appealing to. Some of these edge rushers and the fact that Alabama has recruited that position so well over the last, you know, three going on four years. It's because of the, this current system that they have in place, and I think it's been very effective for them. So, yeah, that defensive line, uh, a lot of people think it's a concern. I think it is what it is, um, and it's, it does its job well, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, you see uh, Tim Smith. You see Justin Abogbe. You see DJ Dell. You have Jamil Burrows. I mean, we can go uh, through kind of the list there. A lot of quality depth, which I think is going to be fantastic here with Clint Lamb of Bama Insider. My name is Kyle Henderson. Definitely hit the thumbs up, like, subscribe. Tons of coverage back at Bama Insider. Uh, go support the great work that Clint does along with Andrew Bone, Jimmy Stein, uh, the whole crew, and of course, Joseph Hastings on the recruiting front as well with Andrew Bone. Um, as we kind of look to these photos, Chris, I'm actually going to switch uh, back to um, a video real quick. I want to get Clint's take on this because this is something that definitely stood out to me. Okay. So when we we're checking out the, the footage that was going through, I stopped and I was like, who is number 18? And I had to go through the roster. Um, because I had to kind of take a double look because, uh, look, that's uh Shaz Preston. And this is a young man who looks, uh, you know, more the part. I mean, I even double checked, um, with the university of Alabama just to make sure we had the same name and, and everything. I mean, your, your take on uh, Shaz Preston looks like a big boy out there, Clint. It looks impressive. And, and more importantly than the size, it was just the stick them for hands, man. I mean, it's incredible. Ball didn't really go anywhere when he catches it, and he made some really good catches. I mean, that one right there. Just this is a guy who, you know, when you look at Alabama and you say, okay, they're searching for more players who are going to be reliable as, as far as catching the football. It was a problem back in the spring. We know JoJo Earl has had a little bit of trouble in that regard. There's a clip earlier in this video of him making a catch, and and it was a he made it fun. But when you really slow down and look at it, still don't think he's got the right hand placement with some of his passes that he's catching. I don't I don't know how much that'll end up affecting him on Saturdays. But when you look at you know Shaz Preston, this is a guy that I think when I watched him, he's he's not built like a prototypical like X receiver, but I think he plays like one. You know, a lot of people are going to look at a guy like him and think. And that's going to kind of be a, a more thickly built slot receiver, going to be able to work some of the short to intermediate stuff. I think he offers a little bit more than that. 
And I certainly think he's going to contribute to that Alabama wide receiver room. But right now, so many guys out there uh, at that position. Alabama's in really good shape, even though, like I said in the past, you know, we we don't know the pecking order, but things are certainly heading in the right direction. Here with uh, Clint Lamb of Bama Insider. My name is Kyle Henderson. We got 200 now in the chat. Um, hit the thumbs up, like, subscribe. We appreciate you. Um, Clint, we had a chance to see, uh, you mentioned this earlier, you had Malachi Moore. Um, looks like he's put on some good weight, along with Brian Branch. I don't know if you noticed, uh, I'm sure you did. It looks like you you watched as much tape as I did from uh, the first practice today. But uh, we have uh, Malachi right now frozen on the screen. But Brian Branch also, it looked like each of those guys, Malachi, I think, put weight on all over, but it looked like Brian Branch's legs. I mean, it looks like he put on some really good lower body weight. Your take on Brian Branch, Malachi Moore, how you think each of those guys will be utilized this coming season? I think Alabama, with those two guys, um, it, it gives them versatility and flexibility because I think either one of them could kick back to safety in the event of an injury to you know Jordan Battle or DeMarco Hellams. That certainly helps. Um, it, but you know, when you look at the builds and stuff, it really, and it's, it's like we were saying earlier, I mean, it, it goes beyond just those two guys. Everybody seems to have put in a lot of work uh, in the offseason strength and conditioning program. And Nick Saban kind of brought that up in, in a roundabout way uh, when he was making his opening statement. He said, you know, guys can do great things as far as preparing, you know, in, in their preparation leading up to this point. But this is a completely different beast is essentially what he was trying to say. I think Alabama was very pleased with the strength and conditioning program uh, over the summer, I've, and and you see the gains. I mean, I think even Kyrie Jackson, while he's still a very lean player, he looks like he's been able to put on a little bit of weight as well, and we already know he's a very physical corner. He's very long, tree trunks for arms, both him and uh, Eli Ricks. I mean, uh, Goulet McKinstry to some degree as well. You know, he's certainly got length, but I'll tell you right now, man, that is prototypical corner, Nick Saban corner right there that you're watching on the screen. You really can't get any better than that. And I think Alabama's in really good shape at, at corner. I think they're in good shape at, at star and at safety. There's so much depth. There's so much versatility that they can withstand, you know, an injury or two if that ends up happening. Very impressed with the back half of Alabama's defense going into fall camp. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, I Coach Saban clearly working with the corners. Uh, he was asked about corners today. I don't know if you noticed. He was asked about corners. Then I think he, he thought – Someone said quarterbacks. So he would like, then he started talking about the quarterbacks a little bit. But the coach Saban, I don't know if you guys know this out there, he labels himself a grad assistant and he works with the corners hand in hand. But you know, he's really the corner. He's a corners guy, he's a defensive coach. So he works with the corners, uh, you know, throughout practice. And uh, it's good to see him out there. I, and again, like the shades are really tripping me out. Uh, back there, that was uh, Coach Charles Kelly, who works with the safeties. And then you got T Rob, Teres Robinson, who works with the corners. Um, and as Clint pointed out, you look at kind of the length of the corners with the arms, and that's utilized clearly for jamming. I mean, these players, uh, this is Eli Ricks, for example. You look at, you know, his arm length. I mean, he's like, crazy. Look at that extension, Clint. It's crazy. crazy. That was, I mean, it's really amazing to see. I mean, yeah. you, 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 I wish I could, like, I had a better system to freeze frame that. Um, because as you can see, when he comes off, right, what's the first thing you want to do in press coverage? You want to be able to jam your wide receiver. Um, so in that aspect, whether he's a corner, that's going to be the far side corner, wherever he's going to be playing man coverage. I think that's an important attribute for any corner to have. Absolutely. And, and Nick Saban, he, and he talked about it at SEC media days, the importance of having quality play at the cornerback position. I don't think people realize when you have guys who can, you know, you feel of confident, not necessarily leaving them you know, in a, on an island necessarily. But when you're getting effective play at that position, and especially when you combine that with a pass rush like we think Alabama is going to have, the 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 opportunities are endless. I mean, you have guys, you know, especially Kool-Aid McKinstry. We talk about the physicality and stuff of a Kyrie Jackson. We talk about the ball skills that both Eli Ricks and Kool-Aid McKinstry possess. But I think Kool-Aid more than anybody, just his natural ball skills are incredible. They're very opportunistic corners, both Eli Ricks and Kool-Aid McKinstry. And when you combine that with what we think Alabama's pass rush is going to look like, I mean, really, it's not even thinking. We know it's going to look like that. I mean, it's going to be absolutely dominant. I mean, it, the things that, you know, quality cornerback play can do as far as creating opportunities for others and, and what it allows you to do as far as, you know, you maybe being able to send the star on a blitz, you being able to get creative with sending uh, Jordan Battle there's going to be times where Alabama wants to take some chances 
And if you've got corners who can survive out there on islands, it gives you those, um, it opens the door for you to be able to do a little bit more of that. And I certainly think that can help Alabama's defense. They've got the pieces all across the board um, and, and the makings and the fact that they're getting Pete Golding back, the fact that it's Nick Saban's you know, baby as far as the defense is concerned, set up very well. But the, the importance of getting that guy right there, Eli Ricks, on top of having Kyrie Jackson and having Kool-Aid McKinstry, you have three quality perimeter cornerbacks so you can kind of build your secondary around, even though you could build it around your safeties, you could build it around your stars. But it all starts with those perimeter cornerbacks, and Alabama's got three really good ones. Here with Clinton Lamb of Bama Insider. I was I was trying to – Chris, let me see if I can uh, – uh, oh, okay, I have um, – I see what I did there. Yeah, I'll, I'll control the um, – the uh the system chris if if that works so let me see if i can get that back home place um here we go um there's your sunglasses yeah but i was going to show you something that's funny in that picture look at the, who's this gentleman back here with the green with this this green ensemble this kind of looks like prison mike right in the office yeah um, yeah the prison mike <laughs> <laughs> the episode where they go in and uh you know and then prison mike says it's not that hard in prison right yeah like, absolutely i heard about it <laughs> i mean that's the first guy i thought about right but back here like hey okay today you're wearing i mean look if you're out there you know what this hat is all about i don't know but i mean whoever had to wear that i don't know taking one for the team clearly um here's coach saving again just kind of show you some photos so we can kind of go through them a little bit um and point out things that you might not have seen um you see right here number 26 this is trey sanders um this is mary miller yeah oh i'm sorry thank you thank you no yeah it, it used to be his number yeah okay um so the the freshman running back um, and then you have Ty Simpson right here. You have Coach with the shades. Um, looks like Sal and Siri in the way back, right? Doesn't he's still it? involved. Yeah, he ain't yeah, going nowhere. Still involved. Uh, here's Coach Saban. You know who this big man is right behind Coach Saban, right? 100. percent Yeah. I yeah, mean, it's uh, Baloo. He's uh, he's he is the weight room. Uh, let's see what we have. Uh, who else we have? Okay, we have Dallas Turner right here. Uh, Keanu Coot right here. To uh, he looks like nine. he's put on a little bit of weight. A little bit, you know, he's he's lengthy, but I I like to see him. Um, I mean, but what what do you think he's at? I guess like two. I mean, he's got to be what two? two th I think they have him listed just just over like two thirty one maybe, and he looks like a two thirty one. Being six yeah, more, he has the frame to put on a lot more weight, right? Yeah, and I think they need to. I think that's a huge area for him is, and this is why it's important. I mean, you look at Alabama's outside linebacker depth. This is a guy who on three had rated as a five star prospect coming out of high school. He's already had one year in the strength and conditioning program. I personally think, you know, you look at it, I think that's benefited him. And then, you know, it looks like he's at least going to get probably at least one more year before he really needs to start trying to make his moves into whether it be the rotation or the starting lineup. Depends on what happens. You know, obviously, you know, Will Anderson's going to leave. Depends on what happens with Chris Braswell. But, you know, him getting a couple of years to develop, I think will help him be able to become a more complete edge rusher or a more complete edge player allowing him to be a little bit more effective on early downs because on third down or in passing situations, I think he's kind of already there. He just needs, you know, it can't be too one dimensional. Chris Braswell has certainly made strides in that area. Now it's Keanu Coates turn. The crazy thing is Clint is Dallas Turner right here. I mean, I have Chris looking up his weight. Oh, Chris is telling me he, they, they have Dallas Turner listed at 240. That's what they have Turner listed at. And uh, also look up uh, Keanu just so we could have that as well. Um, how about this, Clint? My goodness. This is Roydell Williams, right? I mean, th this uh, he's well put together. <laughs> 100%. Coming off that knee injury, both him and Jason McClellan, I don't know if you noticed. There, there was a couple of notes that I want to point out from the practice video. And you never know if, the, if it means anything or if it's just lining up and going through drills but it's at least worth keeping an eye on, right? One of them was that Roydell Williams was actually the, the guy who was working behind Jameer Gibbs, the number two guy in line. Yep. And then it was Jace McClellan. I thought that was kind of interesting. May, might not mean anything. They're both the same age. So, you know, they, I don't know if necessarily if that means anything as far as pecking order. The other one would be the offensive line because I noticed that Kendall Randolph is still working as the first team left tackle. Um, granted, that's not, that shouldn't be surprising to anybody. Tyler Steen, this is his first practice. He's going to have to earn it. But more importantly, I thought it was interesting that uh, Amari Kite, who had been working in offensive tackle as well, and he still might be. You know, Eric Wolford, he's very big on cross-training offensive linemen. 
but with Amari Cotty was working as the second team left guard between Tyler Steen and Seth McLaughlin, which also will tell you that Darian Dowcourt, despite the fact that he missed the entirety of the spring, he was uh, working as the first team center. Now, granted, I'm sure they're kind of exchanging and, you know, it, both guys are seeing snaps with the first team. It's not like Darian Dowcourt's won the job. I just thought that it was interesting that he was working with the first group in the in the clip that we saw and Amari Kite, who had been playing a lot of, of tackle, you know, very he's built like a tackle too, yeah, but he was yeah. he was seeing some time at left guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And uh, you can read more of Clint's great work and his breakdowns back at Bama Insider. Um, your take right here on um, the inside linebackers, we've got uh, Henry Toto right here. Uh, like a lot of these other players, I mean, it looks like he's made some some gains, some strides. And when you look at him on the roster, I want to say he's like 6'2", 228. More than likely, you know, I want to say that uh, Christian Harris was also listed at 6'2". He came in at like six foot, half an inch, the combine. More than likely, that's probably where Toto is more, you know, closer to. Might, might be 6'1", might be a tick under 6'1". But it, last year, I think he played at 225. He needed to gain a little bit of weight. Looks like he's done that. If he can play in that 230 to 235 range, I think that would be excellent and, and, and keep his explosiveness he looks every bit of, of of 230 right now. I don't know definitively whether he is or he isn't, but he at least looks the part. All right, let's see. Uh, let's see who else we got in here. Oh, how about um, this will be an interesting one um, to kind of track this season, I think, is uh, Kendrick Law, right, at the receiver position? Yeah, so many guys, man. First of all, the, the speed of this group just across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, Kendrick Law is another one, man. And he's also, you know, I kind of thought he would be a player that would take a little bit longer to develop uh, i loved his long-term outlook when he came to alabama but then i watched him going through the spring and i was actually very impressed with the progress that he made as a true perimeter outside receiver you know he did a lot of different things for his high school team and now he's you know more so focusing in on on just playing one position maybe moving around a little bit but we, we all know nick saban doesn't like to put too much on the freshman's plate so uh yeah i was i was impressed with him back in the spring Got to be honest with you, when I first saw it, my mind uh, it still was going to Jaleel Billingsley. I don't know if that it, it, that was the one that I saw first, and that's where I was like, when did Jaleel get back? And then I had to remember that it was actually uh, Kendrick Law. But yeah. it's kind of wild that you would even get those two confused because Jaleel Billingsley is such, a, is such a bigger player. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I did the same thing, and most pr people probably did. That's why I almost kind of did a double take, and I had to check – um, with even UA about uh, Shaz Preston, because I, I didn't realize, you know, kind of the size that he particularly had. Um, here's Gibbs right here uh, working next to Robert Gillespie, the running backs coach. Let's see if we have a couple other photos uh, that we haven't showcased. Um, it was like this time of year, you know, you get to dive through all the photos and uh, kind of go through it one by one to find detail. Okay. I do it a, a little bit too much. Um, here's a player I love doing it. about Clint. <laughs> I think I think that guy's pretty good, isn't he? I'm trying to. Is that Bryce? So, right? Yeah, I think it's Bryce. You know, it was one of the funniest stories last year. Was when um, I, I think it was Michael Casagrande. They asked Will Anderson if he had ever accidentally hit Bryce, and he said that one time that he like hit Bryce and like practice stopped, kind of like the DJ stopped the the record, and everyone was like, "Oh, is he okay?" And and then I guess. Uh, who was it? I don't know. Somebody, I guess, I think it was Coach Sal. Then got on William Anderson, but it's it's on YouTube. I uploaded it, but it's one of the funniest. You, you got this. Is the this is the golden boy, and, and I mean, first of all, he does a fantastic job of avoiding those big hits and not you know putting himself in a position where maybe he could get hurt. You certainly would hate for that something like that to happen in practice because of Will Anderson, and we all know what Will Anderson can do with people when he gets a hold of them, right? I mean, we saw it a lot last year. We also heard his comments earlier in the off season about how you know it, he he likes uh, punishing quarterbacks. That's for sure. So I, I will be curious to see how Bryce Young, if Alabama's offensive line can improve this year, which I fully expect it to. It might not be you know a, a finished product in Week One against Utah State. But with three of the first four games being Vanderbilt, Louisiana Monroe, and Utah State, if they can get past, you know, those three games and then also be able to play Texas, and I think Texas, you know, we I think we've talked about it. I don't know if it's been on this show or in other places, but their defensive line, they returned quite a bit. But at the same time, they weren't a very effective defensive line last season. I'll be curious to see how they improve. But uh, if Alabama's offensive line could give Bryce Young just a little bit more 
protection and allow, you know, when the, when things do br- does break down, yep. then it can, you can allow him to kind of be that, uh, you know, unscripted dynamite t- style of player that we've kind of come to, to see him, you know, be for Alabama that the sky's the limit for this kid. Uh, and I think Trent Dilfer, you know, Shannon, uh, Terry, yeah. He he posted on the board early, earlier talking to to Trent Dilfer and apparently has nothing but good things to say about Bryce. Yeah, I uh, I like that post this morning. That was uh, that was some good intel from the chief. Um, hey, so uh, Clint, your take on this schedule? I mean, you know, clearly Alabama is focused about tomorrow's practice, which will be practice number two. Um, again, for those uh, that are um, following our coverage, Sunday will be media day. We will have opportunities to hear from. Uh, Coach Saban, Pete Golding, and Bill O'Brien will have some player interview opportunities tomorrow. Uh, we'll post that on our YouTube channel. Um, but Clint, as you kind of look at this front end of the schedule, uh, what's up, Sean? We see you in the comment box. Um, your take on, let's just, I mean, put it simply, not on Texas, not on Texas A&M. Uh, I mean, the, the first game is against Utah State. And surprisingly, it's at Brian Denny. I mean, since I've been covering the team, I've always been making the drive to Atlanta for the Chick-fil-A kickoff or whatever. But um, Alabama will host the Aggies, uh, Utah State. Yeah, I was in Brian Denny for, for next kid's thing yesterday. And I was looking at the field, and then it hit me that yesterday was August 3rd, which means we were exactly one month away from Alabama being, you know, playing a football game in that stadium. And that was just kind of weird to me because I'm not used to it. But when you look at the schedule, I think it sets up well. You know, there I think for Alabama's corners, if there's any issues, uh, Texas is a team that can exploit that and cause them some issues outside of that. And, and it's not just the corners. It's really the roster in general. You're trying to work out the offensive line. You're trying to get chemistry down with your receivers, with Bryce Young, your cornerbacks. There's a lot of different areas that you like your options, but it's going to take a little bit of time. There's going to be some growing pains. But I think the first month of the season, while it might not be appealing to a lot of fans, I think it presents them with the opportunity to be able to kind of work some kinks out and and to really try to figure out where they're at before, you know, you got a tough, you know, four game stretch there. You got to go to Fayetteville and play Arkansas, very physical, you know, we expect it to be a very physical football game. And then you got the emotional side of things with Texas A&M coming in the very next week. It was also going to be a a tough, hard-nosed football team, but the emotional factor of that game, I think, is what's most important. And then the very following week, you got to go to Neyland Stadium and play what we think is going to be a very good Tennessee offense, a Josh Heupel offense. And then you follow it up with a Mike Leach-style, you know, air raid attack. And it's not the triple option with with Mike Leach, but it's such an unorthodox style of offense that, having to prepare for it. And essentially you're just like, we're completely abandoning our, yep. our run defense this week. We don't even have to worry about it. It, it that stretch, that four game stretch right there, that's going to be what really, in my opinion, determines Alabama season. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right here with Clinton Lamb, Alabama insider. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, when you look to a uh, road game against Sam Pittman's bunch and, and we were talking last night, uh, I think I even talked with Sean about this, talking about um, the fact that, you know, Sam Pittman's done such a great job at Arkansas. I think, especially from the defensive side, you look at the game last year, um, you know, there was a, a lot of points. I mean, Bryce sets the passing record in that particular game. Then you have Texas A&M, all emotion. So you cannot, there's no way that Alabama is going to overlook a game like Arkansas. I'm just saying, and I think what you said too, uh, that's going to be a, you know, back-to-back stretch and then going on the road to Tennessee the third weekend in October. You know, I'm sure Alabama fans are going to travel with their cigars, but, you know, that's a, that's a road game. And um, then you have Mississippi State. And you never know what the Pirates up to, right? Coach Leach. And then you have that open game before Brian Kelly uh, going down to Baton Rouge. Uh, Clint, you've been to a game at Baton Rouge before? I, I, no, I still haven't. I'm, okay. I'm looking forward to it this year, though. That's okay. for sure. Look, I'm going to tell you guys this, okay? I went to a, the Baton Rouge game a couple years ago. And Alabama goes down to Baton Rouge. <clears throat> Okay, the, the tailgates in the SEC, because I'm not from SEC country. So now I've lived here for five years. So getting to experience all this is all new to me. Um, still is. Uh, so I go down to Baton Rouge. I, I mean, I'm like, okay, I love New Orleans. I'm a New Orleans guy. I love the nightlife. I love the music. I love the oysters, everything about it. I'm all in. Go down to uh, Baton Rouge. Alabama's playing. They go, Alabama goes, and uh, the stadium is gigantic. It's loud, but the tailgate was unbelievable make friends you'll they'll, they'll bring you in they don't care if you're alabama whatever you're gonna be fed 
They're going to take care of you. It's going to be amazing. The tailgate was so long that I couldn't even get like my Uber. I had to like walk across the tailgate. And I, I'm telling you, it was the biggest party in the entire country. And I honestly think like, yo, if if LSU would have won that game against Alabama, I think I would have ripped my shirt off, put on an LSU shirt and just partied all night long. It was crazy. Like you were like, <laughs> how could you not? Like it was just like it was Baton Rouge madness. So uh, people in Baton Rouge certainly go hard. And I know we have a lot of uh, 504, you know, uh, callers, you know, they're calling to the show. So we appreciate you guys from uh, Louisiana. And thank you very much for being a part of our show. And thank you for watching right here on Bama Insider. Uh, Clint, before we let you go, man, um, you know, Saban, uh, you know, talked about kind of this offensive line. I I, I drew this up. I kind of circled some names on here about the offensive line. Um, who, which particular offensive lineman are you watching as we continue to track a lot of this personnel movement within the offensive line going into fall camp? Well, first of all, I, I mean, you pretty much hit on all of them. Um, you know, I, what, what I like about this group is that I think it's a lot deeper than it was last year. I think there's more flexibility, and there's a lot of uh, Alabama fans out there, and they look at where guys were last year, and they just expect them to be in the same spot this year. And it's like, you know, that's really not how it works. There's positive growth. If you really trust Eric Wolford and his ability to coach up offensive linemen, which I fully trust him, then you would expect a lot of these guys to take positive steps forward. You know, you've got the guys that everybody's going to be talking about, you know, JV and Cohen, even a guy like JC Latham, despite that he has not been a starter yet. You know, a lot of people project him to eventually be a first round draft pick. I certainly am on board with that. I still think he's got to show it on the field, but he's definitely got the 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 makeup of it. Emil Ikewars had tons of experience. We know about Tyler Steen. I really think that Seth McLaughlin can be, and and I'm not I've been kind of on board with him being the starting center. He's been kind of my projected pick. I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't feel great about it. I feel pretty good, but he's a guy, man. I'm telling you, give him a little bit of time. He needs to a little. He needs to continue to add weight and strength, which I think he's done that a little bit in the off season. I think he needs to improve a little bit in pass protection. But people need to understand when you watched him last year. What was the context, right? What were the games he was starting? When you saw Darian Dalcourt, he started the first 11 games. With McLaughlin, he started against Georgia in the SEC Championship, Cincinnati in the college football playoff, and then Georgia again in the national title game. That's a tough stretch. And by that point, Alabama's running back room was kind of decimated with injuries. So they didn't have the ability. They didn't have the running backs to be able to commit to the run game like they had earlier in the season, that is going to make everybody's job on the offensive line harder because you don't have that aspect. It's something Nick Saban talked about today, that he would like to have a more consistent run game. And so when you look at it, uh, I think that if he is given the opportunity to become a starter, he's going to end up being a very effective, good player for Alabama, not just this year, but for the next couple of years. And, and I'm, I'll be very curious to see how he progresses throughout fall camp. Yeah, good stuff. I, I kind of had my eye on him as well, and I think you bring up great points. I mean, the first game that we really got to see him, um, you know, in action is against Georgia. Can you imagine getting your first, you know, get-go? Hey, hey, Seth, come into the coach's office. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're going against Georgia's defensive line, right? You're just like, all right, coach, I'm ready. And he did a great job. The, the SEC game, look, the national title game, I think, you know, there was a lot of things that maybe didn't go his way, but I think that first game against, uh, you know, in the SEC championship, I, I think he did really well. When you go back and watch the tape, Seth held his own. I mean, he did a really great job. So, um, good stuff. Uh, we have practice footage, um, added some commentary. We have photos. Uh, we have Nick Saban's press conference. We have an update on Cam Latou back at Bama Insider. Type in Bama Insider uh, for all Alabama fans out there. Go check out the website. Um, scoop up your news, your nuggets on Bama Insider. Uh, you had Andrew Bone on Tuesday. Uh, this is like, I, I mean, Bone's not off. He's never off. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm you know, he's, uh, this is the team section. So we bring Bone on every Tuesday to talk recruiting. Um, we'll have Mick Gillespie back on Monday along with Jimmy Stein. Um, Clint Lamb and I have been at it, kind of working the team angle. So all the coverage back at Bama Insider. Make sure and follow us on all the social media accounts, on Facebook, everywhere that you get your Alabama content. We're trying to build something really great here in the Alabama market. So be sure and give Bama Insider an opportunity. Clint does a great job. Follow him on Twitter. Um, Clint R. Lamb on Twitter. And that's right. Right, Clint? Yeah. Clint? Yeah. You nailed it, man. Yeah, I got you. I know all my guys. Um, <laughs> follow him and um, do all the things. Uh, we appreciate you guys. 
honestly i always say that at every single show because honestly if it wasn't for you it wouldn't be for us and we wouldn't be able to do what we love to do which is talk alabama crimson tide football from beautiful tuscaloosa alabama i'm kyle henderson he's clint lamb both of bama insider until next time friends thank you very much for watching our show